Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about Mona, where it came from uh, and where it's going. And uh, so, you know, to discuss a little bit around the issues about how humans get across the current situation of the future world, and it's very little bit about our, um, are we prepared. So, the home is an animal of virus, it's easily killed by a disinfectant, including the human being on the Castle Beach. It's a member of the Philoveridia family that includes viruses like Marburg virus. Um, and there are eight subtypes of uh, Ebola virus. This particular strain is causing this outbreak is the Ebola Zaire strain, which is thought to be more virulent and pathogenic uh, than some of the other strains. The virus was first uh, discovered in the Democratic Republic of Congo, across uh, this before Zaire, northern Zaire, near the Ebola River, which gave it its name. In 1976, and at that time there were two practically simultaneous outbreaks in northern Zaire and southern Sudan. And in the past four decades, um, there have been a number of outbreaks, mainly in Central Africa, um, which have resulted in 3,000 cases. And that's been totally dwarfed uh, by the current outbreak in West Africa. The virus is thought to originate, um, the reservoir is in bats. Um, and bats then can infect other mammals such as uh, the diker antelope, uh, chimpanzee, and then uh, when uh, humans then go to use the bushmeat, uh, they can be infected. And it's mainly then human to human transmission which is involved in uh, sustaining the, uh, the epidemics uh, that are occurring. So, this is an example of uh, bat soup and uh, butchering the uh, bushmeat. Um, that occurs. Now there's a high uh, teeter in feces and it's used uh, then as food and as I said there's an extensive bush meat trade uh, in these countries. But humans now are more uh, frequently infected through direct contact with other humans, through blood or secretions, urine, feces, semen, the rest of all contained virus. And also exposure to objects like blankets, uh, uh, <coughs> surfaces that have been contaminated uh, with infectious secretions. So this occurs through mucosal surfaces, for example, when people touch their eyes, uh, nose and mouth, and um, breaks in the skin, or peripherally, for example, through uh, contaminated needles. So just looking at that current situation <coughs> where we are, this is a distribution of the Ebola virus disease cases that probably has no uh, in the latest update on the 7th of November. And the blue represents, the darkest blue, the areas that have the highest uh, transmission. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's relatively less in Guinea. It's very intense in Sierra Leone. And recently, in some weeks in Liberia, there actually have been a reduction in some of the cases where, um, however, in other parts of Liberia, you know, there is still extensive strong transmission going. The yellow is the number of cases that have been occurring uh, in the past 21 days. So all in all, that has resulted then in over 13,000 cases, which is nearly uh, 5,000 deaths. Um, the most important thing, I suppose, from Ireland's perspective is that Nigeria has now been declared uh, vulnerable-free since the 20th of October, and uh, that was one of the major sources um, of our uh, concerns, because many of the cases that we would have involved in testing, many of them have come from uh, Nigeria. Most of them would have been known as but would have not have had direct uh, contact um, with any uh, of all cases. So the fact that Nigeria is now free should <coughs> remove some of the pressure uh, on our system. Uh, the other thing to mention there is the case in Mali. And as you know, this was a two-year-old child who was bought by her granddad, and all the other members of her family had died from Ebola into Mali and uh, she travelled uh, a long way by bus and also took three taxi rides. Um, but the good news is so far there's no, uh, there has been no appearance of uh, any secondary cases and people are beginning to hope uh, that maybe we won't see evidence of transmission in Mali. Uh, a predominant feature of course of this outbreak has been the number of healthcare workers who have been infected and it's nearly 550 healthcare workers um, predominantly uh, in the infected countries. But as we all know, and what has uh, alarmed, I think, healthcare workers uh, both in the States and throughout Europe and other developing countries has been the negative COVID transmission that has occurred um, in Spain and in uh, the US. Um, 
three hundred and eleven healthcare workers have died. Uh, some recent evidence coming out from WHO who were investigating some of these deaths that have recently said that um, a large proportion of them haven't actually been affected in the Ebola virus treatment centres, and some of these healthcare workers, more of them, have been infected in uh, private clinics um, that have been uh, treating non board cases, you know, for, for people with Ebola have ended up not in the Ebola treatment centres, but in other private clinics, or some of them have been infected in the community. So not everybody who's known as a healthcare worker acquired it in the Ebola uh, virus treat treatment centres. Um, looking then at the cases outside of West Africa, as of the 20th of October, we had 13 uh, confirmed Ebola cases that were medically evacuated. Nine of these have recovered, three have died, and one um, is still hospitalised, but I understand it in the world. So uh, these cases have gone mainly to the US, five to the US, three to Germany, two to Spain, and one each to UK, France, and Norway. And for Europe, I suppose that, you know, would be one of our major risks of uh, repatriation of, um, <coughs> of healthcare workers. But it's important to say that if there is repatriation of healthcare workers, this will be done in a controlled fashion. And there are plans um, in relation to how uh, a case will be repatriated. Increasingly, it looks like through the company Phoenix Air, uh, mm -hmm. which has been, there's a tender note with the European Commission uh, for repatriation of European Union cases. You know, the plans are there for how they will arrive at the airport and how they will be transported here to the Marta National Isolation Unit. Um, the other thing to say is that uh, efforts are being made to um, have facilities in the field. So both the Americans and the English are now setting up uh, treatment centres uh, with you know, high-tech equipment available so that they are talking about that they will increasingly be able to treat uh, humanitarian and healthcare workers in, in food rather than necessarily have to transport them home. Um, looking at the non repatriated cases, we've had five, um, and we all know the story of the um, American Mr. Duncan who came from Liberia, uh, died in Texas, and unfortunately, at the very late stages of, of his illness, uh, transmitted the infection to, to nurses. And then again, in Spain, at the very late stage of infection, uh, there was no recovery transmission to a, a nurse's team. The important thing I suppose to say about all of those cases, um, the American case is, Duncan, he, he had gone into the emergency department uh, twice uh, without initial recognition of his disease, but there was no transmission in the emergency department, and there was no, likewise, uh, the nurse in Spain, she went and was, was diagnosed as by a community GP. There was no transmission there. Um, <laughs> you know, the recent doctor who's gone back to New York, who you was know, sleeping with his partner, uh, came on well, no transmission there. The, the transmission is really occurring in the late stages of the disease and the illness. And I think that's a, a very important message uh, for us all. To remember that, that that is the most dangerous thing when people you know, have huge copious amounts of uh, secretions and um, that that's when they're uh, most of us. So you'll be able to get ongoing updates um, on the Ebola virus situation. They're available from our uh, website, APSC. So the risk to Ireland then would be considered to be extremely low. We, we don't have any direct flights. And in addition to this, this is a, a study which is done looking at air traffic connections from West Africa uh, to other parts of the world. And they talk about 30 countries that might be at higher risk because of the amount of traffic <coughs> coming uh, to their countries from West Africa. And, you know, Ireland didn't, wasn't one of the countries that figured uh, in, in those of the countries that were anticipated to be at higher risk. And it's true that countries that have historical connections, like the US goes with Liberia, that uh, Sierra Leone has with UK, that Guinea has with France, um, there's increased traffic to and from uh, those countries as opposed to Ireland. So we would be considered a low risk. Uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs have no register of all the Irish people who are in the affected countries. And the figures are, you know, they remain around 50 to 60 Irish people, including some of the humanitarian workers who have gone out and the uh, people of missionaries and, uh, you know, who are living there. So there's a small number of Irish people who um, are, are there. 
just to say the predictions, um, many countries have, uh, are, you know, there have been a number of studies that have looked at predictions, and the, the most startling of them, I suppose, was the one uh, done by CDC, which said that, you know, we could possibly have 1.4 million cases uh, in the middle of January. Now, uh, that's the worst case scenario, taking into account the older reported cases and the exponential increase. But it doesn't take into account, you know, the huge mobilization of international effort now. This is a picture of US Marines arriving in Monrovia, and as you know, um, Obama has sending uh, 4,000 troops, and they're busy building uh, treatment centers uh, throughout Liberia. The English are doing the same, sending out troops and uh, healthcare workers uh, to Sierra Leone to aid. So there is a huge um, international effort now that some would argue that maybe it's belatedly, but at least it is happening, and hopefully that, that will begin to impact on uh, some of the cases. Just to quickly talk a little bit about the structures in Ireland um, and the many groups at all levels that are working on this. In Ireland, emergency planning, the overall emergency planning is done by the, Ar the government task force, which is led by the Minister of Health and If we get a case, that will change into a national coordinating group, which will have all departments from, um, from uh, uh, you know, that, that may have a role in defence, uh, foreign affairs, uh, environment, um, have all the departments. Uh, already, uh, the Department of Health is um, leading an Ebola virus disease coordination group that has all these departments, and they're working on things. There's a subgroup working on transport, which is working on practicalities of repatriation. There's an airport group looking with the National Ambulance Service to make sure that we have a smooth transition uh, if required uh, there. So those are the, the blue are all the interdepartmental groups. In green are the health groups. And uh, the health group is led by a joint committee, it's the National Public Health Emergency Team, the NEPA. You may uh, recollect that that coordinated the response to pandemic flu. But that's led by the Chief Medical Officer. There is close connection with a group at the Commission, the Health Security Commission, uh, Commission has representatives from WHO, as I said, the Commission, European Central Disease Control, and all member states to try and coordinate the response and so that all the member states have a similar response. Within a, in Ireland, then, we have um, in HSC the Scientific Advisory Committee, which, as you recollect, produced the original 2002 guidance, updated in 2012, and now we're updating um, that guidance. As new scientific information comes in, um, and for example, in PPE, there was a new guidance that came out from WHO last week, from uh, CDC the week before, and from ECDC last week. So, PPE is, uh, you know, there's another group looking. And, that, and similarly, advice the contact tracing, that uh, advice is again in the real, in the real life of the government's being updated. There's an emerging viral threats group, uh, like Adam Guard, which has a lot of subgroups, too many to put on this, but they are also looking within the hospitals uh, division, the primary care division, public health, national ambulance service, all working to make sure that plans um, are in place and, um, you know, uh, there's also a court health group, which is what in the courts, and the National Public Health uh, Outbreak Response Team, uh, which would um, be formed to, to respond um, and organize things like contact tracing, infection control in the community. For example, one of the things emerging viral threats has done is to get, have a tender for a company that will go in and decontaminate houses if that's required, if there's a case in, in a house, and decontaminate. Uh, GP surgeries, if, if that's required. Um, but the best laid plans um, don't always don't always work out. This is a picture from the window of the Carlos Third Hospital in Madrid, and you can see here somebody who's been quarantined in the hospital, and he's happily telling everybody that his temperature is 361. Um, now, you know, there was it was never in anybody's plans that we would quarantine people in an acute hospital. Um, but as you can understand, uh, both in the States and in Spain, where there has been transmission, there has been huge political pressure. Um, you know, so some of the best laid plans are sometimes altered uh, in the event of that. So in conclusion, then, I'd just like to say that the risk is low, Nigeria is free. However, the epidemic has been involved with intense transmission in Guinea and in Sierra Leone. And, you know, even though Liberia has a recent decrease in some areas, people are worrying that this may be a low before other waves come. And there is a risk of spread to neighboring countries, especially in the Arab coast. The increasing mobilization of international efforts, it will take months, uh, you know, of its work to 
and reverse the trends. There are hopeful things that might come through the new year, new vaccines, new therapies. But one thing that I would say to people, uh, you know, I know you get lots of messages today, but one of the things is please ask anybody with a fever if they've been out of the country. And, you know, one of the most important things is to detect people. You know, there are plans, it's what you do to detect them, but we need to detect them first. So it's important that we, that we ask that. I'd like to acknowledge that uh, some of the slides I have taken with permission from the presentation given by Carl Hatchett. And um, Margaret Fitzgerald also had me with uh, the slides. And um, I've also took that from WHO and CDC. And I'd like to acknowledge, as I said, the huge work that all these people and all these various committees, and I'm sure they're all in their own hospitals, um, working to try and protect us from Thanks very much.